Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. This video is in direct response to a request for a video on a circuit which uses more than one transistor. In this video, I will design a two transistor amplifier. I will be leveraging equations that I developed in the videos on the common collector circuit and the beta stabilized common emitter circuit rather than taking the time to recreate them here. You will find links to these videos in the description. Now, all of the equations are in the downloadable go along with the video sheet. A link to that file to download is in the description below. I will be using both Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws. I have videos on those subjects, and like before, there's a link to those videos in the description below too. I will be also using Thevenin's theorem to create a Thevenin equivalent circuit. Now, if you're not familiar with that, there's a link to my video on that also down in the description. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, we begin by defining our objectives. One of the most important questions we ask in the midst of circuit analysis and design is, what do we know? Sometimes seemingly unrelated scraps of knowledge can be the key to unraveling a mystery. Our first bit of information gathering is answering the question, what are we looking to accomplish? Well, in our fictional world, I have been tasked to create an amplifier using discrete bipolar junction transistors, which has a voltage gain of 10, an input impedance of 10 K ohms, an output impedance of 10 ohms, a quiescent output voltage of half the power supply voltage, and it must run off of a 12 volt power supply. So my first step is to establish what sort of circuit configurations will provide me with the characteristics I need to meet my requirements. Now I will begin with the input side of the circuit. So I ask myself, of the three possible circuit configurations, which one gives me a high input impedance for our input stage? Well, my answer, the common emitter configuration. There has to be a collector resistor. I will call this RC1, well, because it's the collector resistor on the first transistor stage. And I want it to be beta stabilized, so I will have to have an emitter resistor and the voltage divider base bias. The topmost bias resistors I will call R11 because it is the R1 resistor in the first transistor stage. I will call the bottom one R21, well, because it is the R2 resistor. The gain of the input stage is determined by the value of the emitter resistor and the effective value of the collector resistor. More on that one later. We are going to have to be able to control the gain independently of other factors. So I'm going to split my emitter resistor into two pieces and then add a bypass capacitor across the lower of the two. I will call the top emitter resistor RE1A because, well, it's the first emitter resistor on the first transistor stage. This is the one that will help set the gain of the amplifier. I will call the bottom emitter resistor RE1B because, well, it's the second. This one, along with the one above it, helps set the DC operating point of the transistor stage. Now, let's think about the output stage. So, which configuration provides a low output impedance? Well, the answer, the common collector configuration. By nature, there is an emitter resistor. I will call this RE2 because it is the emitter resistor of the second transistor stage. The common collector also suffers from a need to be beta stabilized, so I will have to make sure it too has voltage divider base biasing. I can use the collector resistor of the previous stage to be its R1, 
I will add a resistor between its base and ground to supply its R2. I will call this resistor R22. Well, now we have the complete circuit. But there's one last thing. I have, as always, chosen to use a 2N3904 transistor for this. I'm going to assume a DC current gain, as always, the beta of 200 for this exercise. So let's begin our design process with the output side, as this promises the most possibility of success. In other words, it's easier. So what do we know about the output? Well, we know that it wants to be 6 volts by our design constraint, and we know that its output impedance must be 10 ohms, also by our design constraint. So let's start with the equation for the output impedance for a common collector circuit. The output impedance of the common collector circuit can be approximated by Vt divided by Ieq, where Vt is the thermal voltage and Ieq is the quiescent emitter current. There's actually a lot more to this, but this gives us a very good approximation and you can see the reason for this by referring to the go along with the video sheet. I demonstrated in somewhat detail there. So what do we know? Well, we know that the intended output impedance is 10 ohms. And we know that the thermal voltage, Vt, is 0.026 volts at room temperature. And this gives us 10 is equal to 0.026 divided by Ieq. After doing some algebraic rearranging, in other words, we take the Ieq and the 10 and change places, we get Ieq is equal to 0.026 divided by 10, which gives us a quiescent emitter current of 2.6 milliamps. Now we can turn to calculate the value of the emitter resistor Re2. Well, Ohm's law tells us that the value of the emitter resistor Re2 is equal to the voltage across it divided by the current through it. So what do we know? Well, we know that the voltage across the emitter resistor Vre2 is 6 volts by our design constraint. And we know the current through it, I, R, E2, is 2.6 milliamps from our last calculation. So our emitter resistor value is equal to 6 volts divided by 2.6 milliamps, which gives us a value of 2.308 k ohms. All right. So now let's move a bit further into the circuit with the resistor between the base and ground. Well, now we have the resistor which lives between the base of our second transistor and ground, R22. So what do we know about this? Well, we know that Ohm's law tells us that its value is equal to the voltage across it divided by the current through it. And the voltage across the resistor is the same as the voltage in the base. So let's see what that voltage is. The voltage on the base is going to be equal to the voltage on the emitter plus the base emitter voltage. And we know both of these things. The emitter voltage, Ve, is 6 volts by design constraint. And the base emitter voltage is 0.7 volts by our model. So the base voltage is going to be 6 volts plus 0.7 volts which gives us a base voltage on the second transistor of 6.7 volts. But the problem is, well, we don't know what the current through it is. And this is where we get to pull out our first rule of thumb, which tells us that the current through this resistor should be no less than 10 times the base current. OK, but we don't know the base current. Well, not yet anyway, but we do know that the base current is equal to the emitter current divided by the quantity 1 plus beta. And we know the quiescent emitter current is 2.6 milliamps from a previous calculation. And we know that beta is 200 by design assumption. So our quiescent base current is equal to 2.6 milliamps divided by the quantity 1 plus 200. 
which gives us a quiescent base current of 12.935 microamps. So now we're back to calculate the current through our base resistor IR22. It should be greater than or equal to 12.935 microamps times 10, which gives us a current of 129.35 microamps flowing through R22. Now we finally get to go back to Ohm's law. We now know that the voltage across the resistor VR22 is 6.7 volts, and we know that the current through it IR22 is 129.35 microamps, so we have a resistor value of 6.7 volts divided by 129.35 microamps, which gives us a value of 51.793 k ohms. Well, now we're done with the easy part. Well, with the input stage, we have a lot of interrelated unknowns. And the only way we're going to unravel this tangle is to first gather all the things we know together in one place. There are two guiding requirements which will dictate the operating conditions of this circuit. And these requirements are the input impedance and the voltage gain. Now, let's take a look at the equation for the input impedance to see what we need. We have R11 in parallel with R21. These exist in parallel with the resistance as seen looking into the base of the transistor. So looking into the base of the transistor, we see two entities in series. The first is the input resistance of the transistor itself, which exists between the base and the emitter. This is called R pi. The second is the effective resistance of the emitter resistor as seen from the base. This is equal to the quantity one plus beta times the value of the emitter resistor. Now, we have to be careful here because the specific emitter resistor we're talking about is the one associated with the gain of the circuit, not the one that has the bypass capacitor across it. Because there is a bypass capacitor on the bottom emitter resistor, only the effects of the top resistor, RE1A, is visible from the base. So you can see that there are three pieces to this. There is R11 in parallel with R21. There's the input resistance of the transistor itself, R pi. And then there's the effective resistance of the emitter resistor as seen from the base. So let's take a look at this one piece at a time, starting with R11 in parallel with R21. Well, this process gets a little involved. I will step through this one step at a time to arrive at a nice, clean equation to use. So stick with me on this. This whole business of R11 in parallel with R21 should look very familiar if you watch the videos on the beta stabilized version of the common emitter circuit. This parallel combination is the same as the Thevenin resistance. Well, there was a rule of thumb we applied to the value of this Thevenin resistance in the beta stabilized videos. This told us that the value of R Thevenin was equal to the value of the emitter resistor times one plus beta, all divided by 10. This is the DC operating point. So the RE that we're speaking about here is the same as the sum of the values of both of the emitter resistors in our circuit. I will simply call this RE1. We need to know what RE1 is. And like often, we'll start with Ohm's law, which tells us that the value of RE1 is equal to the voltage across it divided by the current through it. And we know that the emitter current, I, R, E, 1, can be found by multiplying the base current times the quantity 1 plus beta. So we have that piece. But what about the voltage across the emitter resistor? Well, we have another rule of thumb that says that the voltage across R, E is supposed to be VCC divided by 10, 
or 2 volts, whichever is less. So with VCC equal to 12 volts, this gives us an emitter voltage of 12 volts divided by 10, which yields an emitter voltage of 1.2 volts. 1.2 volts is less than 2, so we use 1.2 volts. Now we can go back to Ohm's law for the emitter resistor to put in what we now know. We know the voltage across RE1 is 1.2 volts by our rule of thumb. The current through it is the base current times 1 plus beta, which gives us the value of RE1 is equal to 1.2 volts, all divided by the base current times 1 plus beta. Well, now that we have an equation for the emitter resistor RE1, we can back up one step more to our R Thevenin equation. We will substitute this equation for RE1 into it, and that gives us this messy looking thing. R Thevenin is equal to, we have 1.2 volts divided by IB times 1 plus beta, all times 1 plus beta, all divided by 10. But you know, the 1 plus beta terms in the denominator cancel each other out. And so after a little cleanup, we get that our Thevenin is equal to 0.12 volts divided by the base current. Isn't it amazing how all that mess distills down into such a nice, tidy equation? Now, on to the next piece, our pi. Well, this is the totally easiest piece to get because it is already in the form we need. Now, in actuality, this varies from transistor to transistor, but it's estimated pretty closely by this equation. R pi is equal to Vt divided by IBQ, where Vt is the thermal voltage, which is 0.026 volts at room temperature, and IBQ is the quiescent base current. There, all done. The next piece is the value of the upper of the two emitter resistors. Wow, how do we get at that? Well, let's go back to our design constraints, which tell us that the voltage gain needs to be 10. We go back to the equation for the voltage gain of a beta-stabilized common emitter circuit. This tells us that the approximation of the gain is equal to the effective value of the collector resistor divided by the emitter resistor, which is involved in setting the gain at the amplifier. In our case, this is the upper of the two emitter resistors, RE1A. Now, you might ask what I mean by the effective value of the collector resistor. Well, the gain of the first transistor is affected by the load represented by the input impedance of the second transistor. So the effective value of the collector resistor is the actual collector resistor value in parallel with the input impedance of the following stage. This means that we have to know the input impedance of our second transistor circuit. Okay, so what do we see looking into the common collector stage that follows? Well, the first thing that we see is the value of R22, which we calculated to be 51.793 k ohms. Now, this is in parallel with the input impedance of the transistor circuit itself. The input impedance of the transistor circuit itself is the series combination of the input resistance of the transistor itself, R pi, and the effective value of the emitter resistor as seen from the base. Well, there I go again with this effective value business again. The effective value of the emitter resistor as seen from the base is the value of the emitter resistor times the quantity 1 plus beta. So, we have the input resistance for the second transistor stage is equal to R22 in parallel with R pi plus 1 plus beta times RE2, which gives us 51.793. 
this equation. And what do we know? Well, we know that r pi is equal to vt over ibq, and we know that vt is equal to 0 0.026 volts at room temperature. We know that beta equals 200 from our design assumptions. And we know from our previous calculations, IBQ2, the base current of our second transistor, is 12.935 microamps. The value of R22 is 51.793 k ohms. And the value of RE2 is 2.308 k ohms. Okay, so now let's make these substitutions in our equation. And then we will solve for Rn. And we get a value of 46.611 k ohms. So the effective resistance of the collector resistor is Rc1, the actual value of the collector resistor, times 46.611 k ohms, all divided by the actual value of the collector resistor, RC1, plus 46.611 k ohms. Now, we're going to need this later, but right now we're going to continue pursuing this whole business of the value of the collector resistor. We turn next to Ohm's law, which tells us that the value of the collector resistor is equal to the voltage across it divided by the current through it. Notice, however, that there is a connection to the collector which goes to the second stage. And like I said in my previous videos, anything connected to the input or the output of a circuit becomes part of the circuit. It becomes either a current sink or a current source. Well, we have that very situation here. So we have to write Kirchhoff's current law equation around the collector node. And this gives us the current through the collector resistor IRC1 minus the collector current IC minus the current going into the input of the next transistor stage all equals zero. And rearranging this, the current through the collector resistor IRC1 is equal to the collector current plus the current into the next stage. Now, using Ohm's law, we know that the current going into the next stage, INQ2, equals the base voltage of the second transistor divided by the input resistance. And we know that the base voltage is 6.7 volts, and we know that the input impedance, Rn of Q2, is equal to 46.611 k ohms, so the current going into that second stage is equal to 6.7 volts divided by 46.611 k ohms, which gives us an input current to the second stage of 143.7 microamps. Now, the fact is, including this current in the calculations to come will significantly complicate the math. So the question we have to ask ourselves at this point is, is this input current significant enough to complicate our design efforts with? This is significantly less than one-tenth of the anticipated collector current. So I'm going to make an engineering call on this one. I'm going to ignore this and press on. So now we're back to Ohm's law and the effective value of the collector resistor. We need to figure out what the voltage across it is and the current through it. So let's start with the voltage across it. The voltage across it is equal to the power supply voltage VCC minus the collector voltage VC1. But the collector voltage is the same as the base voltage of the second transistor. And so we know that the power supply voltage VCC is 12 volts. The base voltage of Q2 and thus the collector voltage of Q1 is 6.7 volts. So the voltage across the collector resistor is equal to 12 volts minus 6.7 volts, 
which gives us a voltage across the collector resistor of 5.3 volts. All right, so now we have the voltage across the collector resistor. But now we need to find the current through it. And well, what do we know? Well, we know that the collector current is equal to the base current times the DC current gain, beta. And we know that beta is 200. Now we get to go back to our input impedance equation to calculate the base current. So here's our input impedance equation again. We have our three pieces, which is R11 in parallel with R21, which is the same as R thevenin, which equals 0.12 volts divided by IBQ. We have R pi, which is now 0.026 volts divided by, well, IBQ. And we have RE1A, which is equal to 0.00265 volts divided by IBQ. We also know that the desired input impedance Zn is 10 k ohms, and the DC current gain of our transistor beta is 200. So now it looks like this. Notice that we only have one unknown, IBQ. And now we get to solve for IBQ. Now I'm not going to go through all the math to do this here. For that, you'll have to download the go along with the video sheet. But here is the final answer. The base current is equal to 9.878 microamps. So to answer the question, what is the current into the next transistor stage that I ignored truly insignificant? Well, the collector current can be found by multiplying the base current by the DC current gain, beta. And we just calculated the base current is 9.878 microamps, and we know that the beta is 200, so that gives us a collector current of 9.878 microamps times 200, or 1.9756 milliamps. The current that we ignored was 143.7 microamps, which is 1 14th of the collector current. So, yes, it was reasonably ignorable. All right, now we can double back to the equations that helped us calculate IB to calculate the values of things. So let's see. The first one was R11 in parallel with R21 or R thevenin. Putting in the base current, we get 0.12 volts divided by 9.878 microamps, which gives us a value of 12.1482 k ohms. We're going to need this one later. Next is the input resistance of the transistor itself, R pi. So now we have R pi is equal to 0.026 divided by 9.878 microamps, which gives us a value of 2.632 k ohms. And finally, the value of the upper emitter resistor. So we put in the base current to get a value of 0.00265 volts divided by 9.878 microamps, which gives us a value of 268.27 ohms. We're going to need this value in our next step, calculating the value of the bottom of the two emitter resistors. Well, the bottom of the two emitter resistors is only there to help set the DC operating point of the circuit. It works in concert with the upper one to accomplish this task. So this involves both the bottom and the top emitter resistors. So to simplify our thinking, I will take these two as a whole and call this value just RE1. So what I mean is RE1 equals RE1A plus RE1B. Now, Ohm's law tells us that the value of this resistor is the voltage across it divided by the current through it. Let's start by thinking about the voltage across it. What do we know? We know that the emitter voltage is 1.2 volts by our rule of thumb, which we applied earlier. Therefore, the voltage across the emitter resistor 
VRE1 is 1.2 volts. Okay, so what about the current through it? Well, we know that the emitter current is equal to the base current times the quantity 1 plus beta. And we know the base current, IB, is 9.878 microamps. Beta is 200. So the emitter current, IE1, is equal to 9.878 microamps times 1 plus 200, which gives me an emitter current of 1.985 milliamps. Now we can go back to our Ohm's law equation for the emitter resistor. And now we know that the voltage across the emitter resistor, VRE1, is 1.2 volts. And the current through it, IRE1, is 1.985 milliamps. So the emitter resistor value is equal to 1.2 volts divided by 1.985 milliamps, which gives us a value of 604 0.39 ohms. Now, this is the total emitter resistance value, which includes both the upper and the lower emitter resistors. So, once again, we ask, what do we know? Well, we now know the total emitter resistance, RE1, is 604.39 ohms from our calculation just now, and the value of the upper emitter resistor RE1A is 268.27 ohms per a previous calculation, and this gives us 604.39 ohms equals 268.27 ohms plus RE1B, which is the lower resistor that we're looking for. Solving for the lower emitter resistor value, RE1B, we get a value of 336.12 ohms. So now let's think about the collector resistor. Well, to get at the value of the collector resistor, we go back to our gain equation, which tells us that the voltage gain is approximately equal to the value of the collector resistor divided by the value of the unbypassed emitter resistor. It is the unbypassed emitter resistor because this is the one that affects gain. So what do we know at this point? We know that the voltage gain is 10 by design constraint. We know that the emitter resistor responsible for setting gain, RE1A, is 268.27 ohms. So that gives us 10 is equal to the value of the collector resistor divided by 268.27 ohms. Solving for the collector resistor value gives us a value of 2.6827 K ohms. But I remind you that this is the effective collector resistor value, which includes the input resistance of the common collector circuit that follows. We come back to the equation which we arrived at earlier. I told you we were coming back to this one. The effective collector resistor value is equal to RC1 times 46.611 K ohms divided by RC1 plus 46.611 K ohms. And we just calculated the value of the effective collector resistor RC effective. And now this gives us 2.6827 K ohms is equal to RC1 times 46.611 K ohms on the top divided by RC1 plus 46.611 K ohms on the bottom. We solve this for RC1 and we get a collector resistor value of 2.8465 K ohms. All right, our last stop is to calculate the values of R11 and R21. Well, this is where we have to break out Thevenin's theorem and Kirchhoff's voltage law. Here is the Thevenin equivalent circuit to our design as seen in the video on the beta stabilized common emitter circuit. You can see the loop we're going to use for Kirchhoff's voltage equation. And here is that equation right out of the video on the beta stabilized common emitter circuit. We have the Thevenin voltage V Thevenin minus the voltage across the Thevenin resistance VR Thevenin 
minus the voltage across the base emitter junction VBE minus the emitter voltage VE1 all equals zero. Well, the only things we know at this point are the voltage across the base emitter junction VBE and the emitter voltage VE1. So, if we're going to calculate the Thevenin voltage, we will have to determine the voltage across the Thevenin resistance. We begin with Ohm's law as usual, which tells us that the voltage across the Thevenin resistance is equal to the value of it times the current through it. And so what do we know at this point? Well, we know the Thevenin resistance, R Thevenin, or R11 in parallel with R21, is equal to 12.1482 K ohms. And we know the current through R Thevenin, or I R Thevenin, is the same as the base current, which is 9.987 microamps. So this gives us the voltage across the Thevenin resistor is equal to 12.1482 K ohms times 9.987 microamps, which gives us a value of 0.1213 volts. Now we get to go back to our Kirchhoff's voltage equation. And what do we know? Well, now we know the voltage across the Thevenin resistance, our Thevenin, is equal to 0.1213 volts by our last calculation. The voltage across the base emitter junction is 0.7 volts by our model, and the emitter voltage, VE1, is 1.2 volts by our rule of thumb applied earlier. So this gives us V Thevenin minus 0.1213 volts minus 0.7 volts minus 1.2 volts is equal to zero. Solving this for V Thevenin, we get V Thevenin is 2.0213 volts. In the video on the beta stabilized common emitter circuit, I derived the equation for R1, which looks like this as I morph it into this application. We have R11 is equal to R Thevenin times VCC divided by V Thevenin. And what do we know? Well, we know the Thevenin resistance. R Thevenin is equal to 12.1482 K ohms. We know the power supply voltage, VCC, is 12 volts. And we know the Thevenin voltage, V Thevenin, is equal to 2.0213 volts. This gives us that R11 is equal to 12.1482 K ohms times 12 volts, all divided by 2.0213 volts which gives us a value for R11 of 72.121 K ohms. Now that we have the value for R11, we can calculate the value for R21. Well, to calculate R21, I'm going to leverage the R2 equation from the beta stabilized video, which tells us that R21 is equal to R11 times R Thevenin, all divided by R11 minus R Thevenin. So what do we know? Well, we know that the value of R11 is 72.121 K ohms, and the value of R Thevenin is 12.1482 K ohms. Putting all these values into the equation, we get the value for R21 of 14.609 K ohms. We have now completely defined every component for our design. Now, while I'm going to take this to the bench to see how well we did, I'm only going to show you the results for this effort. This video is already too long from my perspective. Well, without further delay, here's the setup with my multitude of resistors to achieve resistor values as close to the calculated values as I could. All of these details will be in the go along with the video sheet. So, how did it perform? Well, I measured the input impedance at 9.7 K ohms. I measured the output impedance at 12.1 ohms. And you say, well, how did I measure the output impedance? Well, that is the subject of my next video, 
three ways to measure the output impedance of a circuit or device. The voltage gain ended up being 19.5 dB or 9.44 at 5 kilohertz. All of this is a very nice starting place to make the final adjustments to the prototype as needed. Well, I finally completed the whole process. I hope this trip was as fun for you as it was for me. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.